you. I'd like to apologize for being with a mask, but I'm in, in a classroom at Universidade Católica Portuguesa with uh, some of the students, and so we are with a mask in this new reality. Sorry for that. Um, uh, just a little bit about uh, practicalities of this uh, online talk. We prepared this talk uh, specifically for the online um, media, which is something new, at least for me. I think for RV is not that new, but for me it's very new. We will start with the, the, um, the itinerary choices by, taken by four members of the audience who have signed up to take the lead. Then after we will open uh, to questions in relation to the narratives told in these journeys. This should take about half an hour and then we follow with a short conversation with Hervé. We'll then open the floor to the audience for general questions on the overall narrative of life underground. And Hervé, thank you so much for sharing your work with us today. A pleasure. Hervé Cohen is an award-winning artist, a filmmaker, a cinematographer, and he has traveled the world uh, to capture so many different stories, from the Amazon to the countryside of China, the entire United States, Senegal, Benin, West Africa, and of course, Paris, where he's originally from. I hope I didn't forget any of the countries. There are so many. A common thread to all of his body of work is the power of the micro narratives in opposition to grand narratives and how we, the audiences, relate and respond to these short stories, to these micro narratives. Life Underground, which we will have the opportunity to watch today, or better said, engage with, because you will actually select some of the narratives. Today is possibly his work that translates this best. It's a transmedia project with an interactive web documentary and the immersive installation. It invites the audiences to choose among the many, many stories, as well as the social and cultural challenges that all these stories imply and that make up the, the world where we live in. Actually, this project has been developed as an interactive web documentary and also as an installation. And maybe I, I would invite Hervé to, to to speak a little bit about this before the audience actually gets to choose the, the stories. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that, Afri? Yes. Um, so I grew up in Paris and of course as a Parisian, I, I used to all my life take the, the metro and, uh, and then also got inspired by just looking at people around me and and also when I used to travel abroad, for me, the best way to feel the city and to, to have a sense of the, its population was to, to take a subway. So wherever I traveled, where if there was a subway somewhere, I would just uh, discover a place through the subway and through all the crowd and the people around me. And, and, uh, and so I had this fantasy about uh, making a, a film about uh, people's lives and stories that we would uh, connect with through uh, traveling on subways. Um, and for a long time, I had that in my mind and um, I didn't know how to, to, uh, to do it creatively. So I had, I had the idea of making a, a long form documentary uh, where uh, all the stories would intertwine and uh, where we would see all passengers from different places in the world cross path. Um, but of course, it, it's, it's not easy to make a film like that because you don't have, you don't have any uh, uh, dramatic arc. You don't know your characters. So it's, it's not easy to fund also. Uh, so that's why um, one day brainstorming with friends uh, I came up with this idea of uh, an interactive documentary on, on the web. And, um, uh, and then it just felt, oh, everything fell in place because I felt that creating an interactive documentary would recreate the experience of, a, of being a passenger on the subway and looking around and maybe looking at someone 
and would be curious about like, oh, I would love to know about that passenger. This is the experience that so many people have uh, on subways, like looking at people and being curious, wanting to maybe talk to that passenger, but of course never doing it because this is not something you can just do like that. So uh, just uh, creating this platform where you can click on someone's name and then you, you continue the travel with that person and you discover the story of that passenger uh, is something that actually is adapted uh, for an experience on subway, uh, recreating that experience. Um, so yeah, so that's my, that's how I, I came into like creating this uh, documentary and it was the first time for me um, engaging into a different way of storytelling. And it's something I, I really enjoy. Thank you so much for that. So maybe now we, we start with the, the storytelling. Yeah, sure. Um, so how would you want that to, to do? Maybe we start with, with one of the, the choices of the audience. Do you have the, their choices there? Uh, do I have the I don't, I don't, but so, so if maybe you want maybe. us to share some an itinerary with me and I could play it. Uh, Brian, would you like to start? And tell your choice. Hello, um, I'm actually interested with the transition theme. Okay, so just to give you a quick introduction, transition is really for me an important theme that I could feel throughout you know, my encounters with passengers um, because many, many times uh, I could, I, the stories were related to people being in transition in their lives, like uh, uh, an event or something that happened in, in their lives and then they were about to do something or about to move somewhere, about to be someone else. Uh, I'm thinking of a transgender uh, woman who had just her papers um, stating her, her name as a, as a woman. Um, and so I found a commonality in many, many stories and I thought, it's interesting because in the subway, you are going somewhere really physically, but somehow you also, I was able to capture some, someone's itinerary in life and being uh, in transition from one place to another in their life. So I, I really like that uh, theme of transition. So I can, I can totally go, I'm gonna share my screen and um, and click on that. Um, My name is Sandro. I come from Uganda. I'm 24 years old. From childhood, all my friends, they are all boys. I didn't feel like much more on the side of the girls, but I didn't know what it means. 
during my adolescence. All my friends were like, oh, I want to get a girlfriend, but me, I, that thought never came into my mind. That's when I learned that uh, maybe I'm not into girls, I'm into boys, but I had to keep that within myself without telling it to anyone. When uh, I was 17, I met some guy before he moved to my school. As time went on, we became best friends and we were like, we don't have to hide anything from each other. So one day he said, Andrew, I want to tell you something. I love you, Andrew. I don't know how you feel about that. So I told him, I love you too. So we started hiding, when having like intimate with him, like his thing. We used to wait for like when everybody's asleep in the dormitory. That's when I started being in a relationship with the boy. Me and my partner were caught when the warden was moving around looking, coming, checking. That's when he found us in the bathrooms. In the morning, they had to pack our things. They called our parents and we were expelled from school. I was really in shock and I couldn't do anything. Every time I would think of anything, I would remember what my father did to me because he had to beat me up. Even at school, they had to beat us up too much. So it was very hard. And at school, my father again had to do the same in the ones that I had. And up to now, we never talk or we never hear from each other because that's the day when he said, from now on, me and you, we are no longer father and son. My life in Uganda as a gay, it was all hiding. You can't come out in open and say that I am gay. Only you have to do it in secrecy. You have to be able to make sure that your door is locked. Every window is locked. Once they get you, they will want to hurt you, take to police. Some people are killed, some people in the arrest, they thrown into prison, and you never see them again. So when I reached here, that's when I applied for asylum here in Sweden. I live my life. I'm just alone in this world. Although I've not yet got a partner, but I know in the future time to come, I'll get a partner and I'll live the life I want to live with another man and it will be okay with me. So I can continue the trip if you want, or I can talk or you know what you want to do continue the transition journey i think we we could uh, make a continuation a little bit with the transition and then we could follow up with another choice what do you think yeah sure i i can i uh, can continue
Je m'appelle Danielle, j'ai 18 ans, et je viens de déposer mon CV pour avoir mon premier emploi que j'ai décroché chez un vendeur de glace artisanal bruxellois. Et je suis avec un ami, on va en ville pour fêter ça. J'ai demandé ça pour le mois d'août comme job d'été et si possible pour continuer pendant l'année aussi, pour devenir un maximum indépendante par rapport à mes parents. Si je veux devenir indépendante par rapport à mes parents, est-ce que je remarque que je grandis Maman, j'ai 18 ans et c'est bientôt pour moi le moment de, de me séparer d'eux, de commencer ma vraie vie à moi, puis un jour euh, quitter la maison. Mais... Je pense que ça commence dès maintenant, même si je n'ai pas encore fini l'école. Il me reste un an. Puis oui, voilà, j'ai envie d'apprendre à, à vivre sans eux et à me débrouiller tout seul. J'ai besoin d'être indépendante et je ne saurais pas expliquer pourquoi. C'est quelque chose que je ressens un peu profond. J'ai... Ouais, j'en ai marre de vivre avec eux, en fait. C'est un peu triste à dire, mais... J'ai besoin de changer d'air et de... Ouais, de, de créer mon propre univers à moi, ma propre vie. Il y a des choses que j'aime vraiment pas dans ma famille. On est très différents, mais j'ai besoin de, de partir. Je pense pas pouvoir avoir un appartement tout de suite avec le, le boulot que j'ai décroché, mais je compte euh, mettre de l'argent de côté. C'est pour ça que je commence à travailler maintenant. Même si je partirai pas avant l'année prochaine, ça c'est sûr. Sinon, je suis pas très très optimiste et j'ai pas beaucoup d'espoir pour euh, le monde qui nous entoure et tout ça. Parce que je sais qui sont les maîtres, plus ou moins. Je sais qui, qui sont ceux qui nous contrôlent. Ce que je déteste absolument, c'est le capitalisme. La domination d'un groupe d'humains par un autre groupe. Le, le gouvernement, la famille royale et tout ça. Je, suis, je me rapproche très fort des, des anarchistes. La dernière manifestation que j'ai faite, c'était pour la non-fermeture des squats et contre l'expulsion en plein hiver des personnes dans la rue, justement. Et pour aussi contester contre le prix des logements très très haut à Bruxelles précisément. Ce qui fait chaud au cœur, c'est de voir que les gens bougent, se mobilisent et qu'il y en a beaucoup qui se mettent à réfléchir. Mais d'un autre côté, quoi qu'on fasse, on n'arrivera pas à faire changer les choses, ou du moins pas maintenant, où on n'est pas encore assez, assez nombreux. Et du coup, on peut tous essayer de faire quelque chose pour changer la vision que les gens ont de la société, pour les faire réfléchir par rapport à leur manière de vivre. Mais même s'ils s'en rendent compte, ce n'est pas pour autant qu'ils arrêteront d'agir comme ils le font. Non, je ne suis pas optimiste. Ok. Can you hear me? So, yes. should, we, should we talk or do you want to see one more? Or? I think maybe we could, we could give the, the floor to the, to the second, second choice. Hilaria, would you like to, to tell us an itinerary of your choice? Yes, thank you. Um, I would love to follow the dream path. Dream, okay, sure.
Je m'appelle Ben, je viens de Bordeaux, où je réside dans une maison avec mes parents, je suis anciennement cuisinier et j'ai 21 ans. C'est une année charnière pour moi, parce que je m'apprête à partir, à laisser tous les gens que je connais, ma famille, mes amis, pour les vivre ailleurs, pour démarrer une nouvelle vie. Là, je me dirige vers l'Angleterre, où je vais partir vivre avant, pendant un an, où je n'ai aucune attache, je ne connais personne, je parle un peu l'anglais, mais c'est l'inconnu, c'est l'aventure. J'ai décidé de partir parce que là où je vivais, j'avais l'impression de tourner un peu en rond. Après euh, plusieurs années à Bordeaux, à visiter les mêmes lieux, à voir les mêmes personnes, on finit par s'ennuyer. Alors je vais partir à quelque chose que je ne connais pas du tout pour voir comment elle allait. Dans mes rêves, je me sens souvent perdu parce que je sais que je vais beaucoup voyager, que je n'ai pas vraiment d'attache et on se sent souvent seul, mais en même temps, c'est l'aspect qu'on recherche quand on voyage. Ce qui me fait le plus peur dans la vie, je pense, c'est de rester bloqué dans une situation à laquelle on ne peut pas échapper. On s'enferme dans une routine, on a peur que ce ne soit pas la bonne, alors du coup, on en crée une autre. Et je fuis la route. J'ai envie de créer plusieurs routines différentes afin de, de permettre d'avoir plusieurs vies, un peu comme un chat. Mon but, c'est de me transformer en marche. Avoir cette vie. Chaque année, un nouveau pays, une nouvelle ville, avec une nouvelle langue, de nouvelles personnes, faire un nouveau sport, un nouvel instrument de musique, avoir une nouvelle copine, avoir un nouvel endroit où vivre. Alors, ce qui me fait plus peur, c'est ce pourquoi j'ai envie de partir, c'est de me retrouver complètement largué, d'être complètement paumé dans les rues, de ne pas comprendre ce que les gens vont me dire, et d'être complètement déconnecté à un point où je ne plus rien. On n'a plus de repères. Et en même temps, quand on n'a plus de repères, bah, l'un des repères, c'est soi. Walking 最深刻就是当我把他过生的时候 Hong 
神俾我嘅恩賜咧，就我有兩例嘅資產，就有兩個女啦。所以我覺得好開心咁去生活嘅每一日。我就喺二零零五一月，明報買咗呢個病係咩嚟嘅？我就打俾登呢個報紙嗰個社工，我就問佢。我係咪呢個病？因為咧，我淨係知道英文點串嘛。嗰、那個社工就話：係啊，你係呢個病嚟㗎。誒、呃，由今日開始，你知道有中文名㗎啦，就叫多發性眼癌症啦。咪、嗯、因為我喺嗰段時間裏邊，啲報紙就講呢個病唯一嘅名藥就係開心。所以我咪接受咗呢樣，因為我成日都話，你開心又嗰一日，唔開心又嗰一日，我選擇咗開心。Maybe we we follow with the the third itinerary or. Or maybe we we can open for questions to Brian and, and Ilaria if you wish at this point. Do you guys have have specific questions on on the stories? Yeah, I have one question actually. Yes. Um. Um. So how how did you um? I don't know if start is the good word, but did you start randomly shooting or? Um, asking for stories, or you already kind of came to the field with themes in mind. Was Not it the theme all. first, or the story, or the story first before the theme? So no, it's the idea of the project is to is to count on random encounters. It's really about serendipity. So the idea is when I look at someone. I don't. I. I'm intrigued. I want to know more. I have an intuition, and then I approach that passenger with that, and I ask the passenger, "Would you agree to be filmed?" Um, and in, would you agree to be filmed silently? Uh, don't pay attention to me. And then afterwards, if you have a moment, uh, I can record your voice so you can tell me more about yourself. And then I film the passenger. I don't know the passenger story at all. I'm not looking for anything. I'm just following my intuition and you know my desire also to engage with with someone. And uh, like that person that you saw in the wheelchair. Yeah. Um, and then um, afterwards, uh, we take a moment in a quiet place. And for that person in wheelchair, she invited us over to her home. And then we we stay, you know, we and then I record the voice just with no camera, just an audio recording. Right. Uh, and then that's the moment where I discover the person's story. Same thing right. with the first passion that, that we saw in uh, in Sweden in Stockholm. We we had an exchange, you know, we looked at each other. I was like, wow, a, a black person in Stockholm is so rare. I I'd love to know the yes. the story behind. And uh, same thing. I filmed him. Didn't know anything about his story. And then afterwards, uh, we found a place like a, a lobby of a hotel, and we sat down. And he started to to tell me about his story, and that was so powerful. Yeah. So that's the way it happens. Following my intuition and my uh, uh, yeah, my my desire to my curiosity about people. Thank you for capturing the stories. They're really beautiful. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe we, we follow up with another story? OK, sure. Uh, Anna, would you like to, to choose one? Yes, it could be aging. OK. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Jestem Mira Szefer, mam 63 lata. Jako mała dziewczynka chciałam uczęszczać do szkoły baletowej, a mnie tak razy pokierowały. Pracowałam jako modystka. Mnóstwo nakryć głowy wykonywałam pięknych. Byłam bardzo zakochana w swoim mężu i nie widziałam przez to zakochanie, nie widziałam w nim pewnych różnych wad i zachowań jego. No, zgadza mnie po prostu. Ja, to, to, to jest w ogóle, to jest dwa, dwie książki można napisać. Ja inaczej, on inaczej. Moim marzeniem jest mieć własne mieszkanie, żeby uwolnić się od człowieka, z którym jestem. Bo życie bez miłości, z kimś, z kim się nie chce być, a się jest, to jest bardzo trudne. Bardzo trudne. Gdybym mogła zacząć życie od nowa, na pewno bardziej bym była ambitna, i kształciła się, żeby być bardziej samodzielną, niezależną od partnera. A trzeba w tym tkwić i to jest najgorsze. Moim marzeniem było poznać jakiegoś pana super bogatego, żebym, żebym mogła sobie polepszyć nie tylko byt, przede wszystkim uczcie. Piękne uczucie. Stacja Bielanicka. Zapoznałam Arabę. I ten Arab właśnie dał mi to uczucie. Zapoznałam w kawiarni. Było jedno wolne miejsce. I przyszedł pan i pyta, czy może się dosiąść. Proszę bardzo. Zapoznałam cudnego człowieka romantycznego, darzącego niesamowitym szacunkiem kobiety, przy którym czuję się wspaniale. To jest historia, którą sobie wymarzyłam i wyśniłam. Just going back to, I wanted to show you a specific one from AJ. I'm gonna go directly.
Je m'appelle Eliane, mais tout le monde m'appelle Lily. Parce que c'est plus gentil. J'ai connu un grand amour, mais malheureusement, je... ça n'a rien donné. J'ai vécu la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. Hein. J'ai connu un militaire américain. Un garçon très sérieux, très gentil. Donc, je connaissais bien l'anglais, on, on correspondait tout, tout le temps. J'avais un paquet de lettres comme ça. Je n'avais jamais dit à mes parents, je ne sais pas. Mon père m'aurait enfermé. Hein. Il venait me chercher au bureau. On faisait la route ensemble. Et puis, à un moment donné, je lui ai dit, très attention, il s'appelait Ray. Parce que mon papa vient souvent par ici. On allait à pied par le centenaire. Un jour, il m'a écrit « Maman et moi, nous t'attendons. » Si j'avais dit à mes parents, mais ils m'ont renfermé, je n'avais dit. J'ai dû écrire malheureusement à ce cher amoureux que je ne pouvais pas. Ça, c'est tellement grand qu'un que malheureusement, je n'ai pas pu suivre. C'était mon grand chagrin. J'y pense souvent. C'est très curieux. J'ai rêvé un jour que j'étais dans une forêt et il n'y avait pas d'issue. Mais c'était merveilleux. Il y avait des plantes, des fleurs. On ne trouve pas sur notre terre. Alors je me dis, c'est quoi C'est le paradis. C'était merveilleux. Mais peut-être avec tout ce qui me jette dans ma tête, toujours la nature, les fleurs, je vois des choses, c'est irréel. Il y a beaucoup de choses qui me préoccupent parce que j'ai peur de l'avenir. C'est normal. Hein? Et puis je pense que je suis, je suis un peu un boulet pour ma nièce qui s'en fait beaucoup pour moi. Elle voudrait que je rentre dans une maison de repos. Je ne désire pas. Je suis trop indépendante. Elle dit donc, Lily, tu devras quand même un jour rentrer dans une maison de repos. Tu ne sauras plus rien faire. Et ça, ça me préoccupe beaucoup. Évidemment, il y a un jour où je. Je ne saurais plus rien faire. Il faudra pourtant que, que je fasse comme tout le monde. Mais je ne suis pas comme tout le monde. Je suis une personne fort étrange. Malgré tout, je lutte toujours. Et, et je sais que quand je vais casser ma vie, comme je dis, et quand je vais mourir, on aura une vie merveilleuse après ça. Je... Alors que, que je disparaisse le plus vite possible. C'est ça que je veux. Hervé, this, this was like the, the perfect wrap-up story. It's so beautiful, this one. Yeah, this one is, is definitely my favorite. Like, this just such you a know, After you told me about this story, I kept on looking on the website and I tried to find it and I couldn't. So I'm so, oh, really? happy. Yeah, I'm so happy that you shared it. And it's okay. amazing that uh, most uh, stories that are being told by by the passengers are so visual. I could see the places that they were describing. Uh, oh, that's, that's wonderful. That's really, really, really amazing. That's the power of, of the voice, you know? I mean, the voiceover is so powerful. It's just, you know, it brings you into the emotions of the person and it's, um, uh, So we're talking about new ways of storytelling, but for me, when I wanted to, when I was thinking, how can I best have people tell their stories? And I thought with a camera, it's going to be complicated because people are going to be intimidated. They're not going to, you know, they're going to feel self-conscious, but with a microphone only and just face-to-face -face interaction, people would just open up and they would, uh, you know, They, they would feel confident. And uh, that's how I was able to capture these intimate stories and so like profound and, and personal. Yeah, it's amazing because it, it feels like a, a friend's conversation. It feels like they are talking to a friend and just telling a story, a story of their life. Yeah. And it's also amazing, it's, it's all very human stories. and we can all relate to each one of, of it and, and that's really really powerful yeah. another thing that that i find really powerful in your work and then i will pass the floor to the audience um 
is the, the sounds. Because in a film documentary, usually you expect to hear, at least at some point, some music. In this film, we don't hear any music, but the sound is super powerful and super important to the narrative. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yes, yeah, sure. So the, the sounds of subways, for me, are, are beautiful. Mm -hmm. And we can actually, what, what we've what I've done, on the all the tr the travel sequences, not not the passengers sequences, but the travel sequences, I have with the sounds that I had recorded from the subways. I asked the musician to create and to craft some pieces of music just with the raw sounds of subways, and so all the the, the musical elements that you hear and the sound elements that you hear on the travels are actually musical tracks crafted only with raw sounds of sub subways because I really find in subways that the, the sounds could be musical. Could, there is a lot of rhythm, you know, there is a lot of sometimes melody and uh, I wanted to, you know, to find that beauty and to, to, to create something with it. So we had a, an amazing collaboration with this musician who, uh, who took that work at heart because he also finds, you know, we, we were joking together because I was like, you know, when I hear, when I listen to a, a, a washing machine or a dryer, there is a rhythm and I, was, I, mean, I can be inspired. And he said, me too, you know, I, I love that. And of course in subways or trains, we can find that element. So it's really the idea of finding beauty, you know, in, in everyday life, you know, in a very dull uh, environment and we can, you know, find something, you know, that inspires us. Wonderful. Thank, thank you so much for that. I would have so many questions, but I believe that the audience has some questions as well. So maybe I, I would start first with Ilaria and Anna, who shows uh, some puffs, and then I will pass on to the, to the larger audience. Ilaria, maybe? Yeah, I actually had a question related to how the people felt comfortable in telling their stories. It sounds strange to me that they were able to be so open, uh, but maybe on the other hand, they felt like they, this was a therapeutic dialogue. I don't, I don't know, maybe they were looking for something like that. They were in need of talking to someone and open up. Oh yeah, that's very true, actually. So this is one of the mysteries of this work is how you know could it be possible to get people talk to me uh first miracle is just when they say yes i agree to be filmed second miracle i i agree to talk to you <laughs> and and then when i discover the depth of their stories and and sometimes even people give, tell me their secrets something that they had never told anyone and this is another miracle. It's like, how can that be possible? But I can, I can feel that when you're in a position to listen and when people feel that you really listen, then they are confident, they feel comfortable to speak. And, and so many people, you know, don't have that space actually. And uh, I am just a stranger passing by and they say, okay, this, this guy, I will never see him again. I don't know him. I just, you know, I can just talk to him. I may as well talk. And it just sometimes to get things off of their chest, you know, uh, is, is a good thing. And just, you know, being in a position of looking at people, acknowledging them. It's sometimes when I tell people, can I film you? I find, you know, I find something interesting in you, interesting in you. All of a sudden they feel, wow, you know, I, uh, I don't know, I, I feel, they feel self, you know, their self-esteem in some way is acknowledged or, you know, built like someone looked at me and felt that I was worth being filmed or listened to. And then that opened doors, you know, to, uh, to, to them being confident and comfortable telling them, telling their stories, telling something about themselves. And I had that case many, many times. And sometimes I had someone, uh, she wrote an email to me, it was in Chile. And she, she told me, uh, after I talked to you, um, 
so many things changed in my life. Like, you know, this, she, she probably, she, she felt acknowledged and, uh, uh, and that was like a pivotal moment in her life where, okay, I was able to maybe tell someone my story and all of a sudden all the other, other things unlocked in her life. And I had that many, many times. So it's a mystery. <laughs> Thank you, but it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Anna, uh, do you have any questions as well before yeah. we open to, to the larger audience? Yes, I have uh, one or two. Uh, I, I would like to know if uh, the conversations were also randomly or did you have already a set of questions or themes that you wanted to approach? And or if these teams, the themes were only selected in post-production. And uh, the second question is about this uh, get inside the cabin. Oh yeah. Uh, because it's, it's really amazing and the lights <laughs> are really amazing. <laughs> but uh, this is the place you never go, but how this relates to, to, to the project and the other uh, stories that you show in your project. Mm. So to answer that question, so it's really, it came from a fantasy. So this, this whole project came from a fantasy, a fantasy of uh, knowing whatever people have in, on their mind or uh, knowing what they're thinking about their lives. It's just like, it's a, it's a fantasy project for me. Um, I had fantasized about it. And then getting into, in, inside of the driver's cabin was the same thing. Like, Every, every kid, you know, <laughs> or adult, you know, dreams about, about that I and mean, being in the front, you know, um, uh, of the train and uh, being with the, with the conductor, with the train driver. And, uh, and it, for me, it was part of the project. Like I wanted to do that. <laughs> so uh, it, was, it was very exciting to also, it's a nice way sometimes to look at the city from above because, um, when the trains go outside, you have a unique view of the city. And for me, um, I, I, I selected those passages when the train goes outside. I love the tunnels too. You know, there is also something very dreamlike, you know, to, to travel the tunnel for, for so long. And, and all of a sudden you go outside and you have, you know, a view of, of a place, of a city. So, it, for me, it was it was a quite quite an amazing experience to to film uh, from the driver's cabin. And to tell you to answer about the, the the previous question, I had a few sets of questions. The first question that I always ask is, "Where are you coming from, and where are you going to?" Which is a very simple question, but sometimes with the answers, it already tells something about the story of someone, you know? Uh, and uh, many times um, you, from that question, you develop something uh, because it tells, you know, it, t it tells something about where the, so for example, the, the young guy who had his backpack and he was coming from uh, Bordeaux, south of France and going to, to travel to England, you know, this guy from Paris, I, yeah, he was, that question was actually perfect because he was leaving his, his place and going to somewhere he didn't, he doesn't know, he has never been. And, um, and so the other question that I also always have is, can you share a dream that you had recently during your sleep? I'm always curious about people's dreams. And, uh, and sometimes this, Talking about a dream is revealing also about people's state of mind. And um, it could also open to uh, a deeper conversation. It opened doors to a, a really deeper place, you know, where people's um, uh, state of mind is or uh, uh, their mood or their, you know, their problems in life. Or I'm thinking about this old woman in the, the last story that we listened to in Brussels who dreams about paradise, actually. She dreams about, you know, a, a forest where she has never seen anything like this, like the 
the vegetation, the flowers, the trees were didn't exist in this in on Earth, and uh, and she or, she is already dreaming about, and, and this is a place she couldn't escape. So she was already dreaming about, you know, afterlife, and uh, and that was what she was actually thinking of, you know, about, you know, she is going to die soon. Thank you. It's very easy and, to connect with your project. Thank you. Thank you. So the other, and then the other, the, the rest of the conversation, you know, follows up, you know, through, through these questions. And I don't, sometimes, yeah, I, I ask people about, you know, if they have something they regret in life, that something that keeps, you know, bugging them in their mind, they keep thinking about. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, this set of questions, but then afterwards it goes naturally to other topics and uh, according to the conversation that we have. Thank you so much, Hervé. Maybe now we, we open the floor to the larger audience. Does anyone have questions, the ones uh, hearing us on Facebook? Okay, uh, well, so Actually, I have I have still some some questions and, and comments because your project is is so rich. So if you don't mind, I will make a question myself. Okay, um, sure, of course. Your your project has many different ways of, of telling stories. I don't know if they are new or if there is something as such as a new way of telling a story. I actually think that you are going back to the roots of telling stories, which is listening to other people's stories, which is great. Um, however, I was wondering about the reactions of people when they listen to these stories in different settings, because one thing is, is seeing your project on a screen, as mm -hmm. we are now. Another thing is seeing an installation and then seeing an installation in a small museum, say in Lisbon or wherever, or seeing it in a very large museum in LA, mm -hmm. or that seeing it in a public space, it, it should be something different. Could you maybe show us some images or tell us a little bit about the, the differences? Oh yeah, sure. So um, my other dream <laughs> for this project was to create uh, an installation, an immersive installation. I really wanted to have people uh, feel um, as if they were in a subway space, like to share the space in a physical space, like uh, uh, in a dark space, in a museum or in a public space, install big screens and with the sound, with the images uh, to have the subways be, be felt, you know, this environment be felt as if we were in it. Um, so this this was this was my my really my other dream about life underground and actually we created a few we had a few ex so the idea was was to create an experience you know beyond uh, looking at it through a computer to create a bigger experience so a physical experience because the subway is uh, also a physical space you know we are close to people we are in in a crowd and so. I wanted to fill that with life underground to have that experience in a in, in a place with other people, and so so then we, our first experience was in Los Angeles in uh, in actually in the in the uh, in the big uh, space which was at Union Station, which is a, a station where they you know all the subways and and uh, light rail and train and buses meet so it's a very it's a big hub um and so we had a we had a space where we installed screens and just people passing by were able to take a moment and sit down in front of a screen or walk from one screen to another and experience uh, the the subways of the world and also be in connection with passengers and because of the size of the screen and because of uh, the immersive, you know, soundscape, um, 
it was really amazing to see how many people stayed and they were passing by, but actually they stayed for, for a while. And, uh, and sometimes they would go back the day after. And so that was like an experience where we connected with just random people. They didn't, you know, they didn't have a ticket to enter a museum. They would just, uh, they're passing by and they would enter the space and, and experience it. But we had another experience also at a museum, at the National Museum of Singapore, where the visitors would enter like a dark, a dark space and, uh, and, and they would spend some time also connecting with passengers on the same principle. And I can show you because I have a video that I uh, recorded uh, with excerpts of that. So if you want, I can share my screen and, and show it to you. Okay. Um, mm. No, Hervé, I think we, sorry, I think we have a, a question. Can I pose oh, the question to of you? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what about the teamwork after the movie clips were edited to set up the inter interactive framework? Did you first acknowledge what technologies you would make use of? Uh, can you Can you repeat the question? Sure. What about the teamwork after the movie clips were edited? So meaning to set up the interactive framework to, to make the actual installation. Did you first acknowledge what technologies you'd make of? Did you, did you think about the different tools, uh, technical tools that you would need? Mm, yeah, so the teamwork, uh, it's interesting because we, um, we had a, a team of uh, a web designer and uh, a coder. Um, and with the web designer, we design, you know, the uh, interactivity, you know, and, and also I, I wanted to have all the themes, you know, uh, laid out and available. So um, the idea was we had asked, our, uh, we, we asked ourselves many questions about how would people interact with uh, this work? But I had one idea. The idea is, was to, in order to unlock passenger stories, we would have to travel to do like, to take this journey because I didn't want people to click directly on a face and, and access the story. For me, it's a process. We have to be curious about people to have the opportunity to look around and then be intrigued by someone. So through this process, because this process is, is, is interesting to me, it triggers, it encourages people to be curious uh, and to look around and to be open to other people. I wanted to keep that journey. So we cannot access directly to passenger stories. We have to take a journey, you know, if you, if you go to, to Brussels or to Santiago, Chile, or to Hong Kong or to Tokyo, you travel there, you take a journey, and then all of a sudden you look at people and, and you look at, there is a name coming up, showing up, and then you can click. So I wanted to recreate the experience of traveling and be curious about someone. So that's, and that's how technology uh, allowed us to, you know, intervene and, and uh, that's how we use technology to, uh, to create that experience. I don't know if I uh, answered the question. I think you did. And we okay. have uh, another question before you show us the, the images, which is related to sponsorship. How did you finance your project? Oh yeah. So, uh, the, this, um, this project was funded mainly through sponsorship from the subways themselves because, uh, so we came to, uh, to the subways through an organization called UITP, Union for International Public Trans Transports, and they're based in Brussels. Uh, and they, it's like a union of different public transportation agencies. And uh, they, um, they were really interested in this project because for them, it was wonderful to have, uh, to shed light on the human aspect of public transportation. And for them, it was a, the best way to 
uh, to promote public transportation. So this organization, they have all these subways members and they actually told them if you, you should participate to this project and, and also participate financially too. You know, if you want to participate to you, you give a little bit of money, you, you sponsor it. And, and so that's, that's how it worked. We had some financial, financial participation from these subways, um, but also we had some uh, public money from the French government for the Ministry of Culture, uh, the CNC, Center for Cinema. Uh, so that's how we funded the project, which brings me to another part because there are so many other subways that I would like to go and to film, but they don't have the budget or they don't have the means to, to fund the project. So my next goal is really to, to find other ways of funding that project through grants or through, uh, you know, in investors or uh, uh, any uh, sponsors too, you know. So for example, I have in mind Santiago in, uh, I mean, not Santiago, Buenos Aires in Argentina. They are really interested in this project, but you know, there is in the middle of financial crisis there. It's, a, it's, it's not easy to find like a, a budget for cultural projects from the subway. So if I had some, you know, some, some money, I would definitely go there. I would also go to India or I'll, I would also go to uh, Algeria because they have a subway there. I would go to Addis Ababa. They have a, a light rail in Ethiopia. So I, I've, I haven't filmed in, in Africa yet. So I, I, would, I would go to all these places where they don't have the funding, but uh, it would bring another, you know, it would bring more balance in, in my, in my uh, map in the, in the project so I could have more and more cities. Um, so that's, that's the uh, financial aspect of the project. Great, I, I just have two uh, more final questions to you. Yes. Uh, one is, did people uh, tell you stories that they didn't want uh, to be included in the film? And if so, do you know what happened to Ray? Lily's boyfriend was in war. And, and then the second and final question is, what's your next project? Mm. Uh, so the first question was, can you repeat? No, of course. <laughs> Did people tell you stories that they didn't want to be included in the film? And if so, do you know what happened to Ray? Lily's boyfriend was in war. Oh, yeah. So, um... I had, I had one, one instance where there was a young woman in Hong Kong uh, who, so each, each, each conversation in, in, is, in, happens in the, in the original language. I don't want people to, to talk to me in English because it's also a project about languages. I really, really love languages and I want other people from the other places in the world to listen to languages. So, in Hong Kong, uh, this young student was talking to me in Cantonese, which is the language they speak there. Uh, but at one point she said, she told me, I want to tell you something in English because I don't want my family to understand. And she, and she revealed to me that she was actually gay and uh, that she had, you know, she was struggling with that and she didn't want her family to know, but so, so she she confided in me that story and I was very like moved and um, but then the day after she sent, sent me a message saying you know I don't want that to be published because what if my parents you know found, found it and, and got to understand it I, I would be, be really uh, embarrassed about it so that's the only one instance where someone told me a story and then afterwards she and, and afterwards told me, I don't want it to be, to be revealed. But other than that, everybody, you know, was okay with uh, telling me their stories. No one, after seeing the story uh, on, on, online, no one called me or sent me a message telling me, oh, finally, uh, can you erase me? You know, I don't want me to, I don't want my story to appear. No one has uh, ever told me that, which I feel really good about it. So what was the next question? It was, what's your next project? And so for that, I will add any projects in Lisbon to show your project here. 
Uh, I would love to go uh, to the actually to the mat. You know, my original idea would be to uh, to do this installation at the Museum uh, of uh, uh, Art and Architecture and Technology in Lisbon and and show life underground in a physical space. So that's I would love to. I love I love Portugal. I love Lisbon especially, and. Um, Gosto de falar português também. And so I would love to go to Lisbon for sure. Uh, but my next project is uh, a series of short films that I've created. Uh, I see that someone is clapping. Uh, Anna uh, is a series of short films created by young filmmakers because in 2020, I was not able to do any more shoots in For Life Underground. Although it's, it's a project that is going to continue uh, but because I, I was not able to shoot, I had this idea to ask young filmmakers, and many of them are the assistants that worked with me on Life Underground. Uh, I, I asked them to create a short about their lives at the time of COVID. And so I became a producer and a curator, actually, and I was, I was not a filmmaker in this project, but I created um, a series made out of all these shorts from people from all over the, all over the world. They're young filmmakers and, they, and it, it's a story about themselves. So it really relates to Life Underground because it's also, I also push them to, to tell them, to tell us about themselves, to tell their stories, but they are filming, they are the creators. And uh, so this, this is called Co-Visions. And it's going to be to be seen, I hope, soon. But I'll, I will let you know. Thank you so much. It, it was so, so inspiring to, to watch the, the film and, and to get to know more of your work. Maybe we could, I know that we are running out of time, but maybe you could just show us one image of the, the installation. Oh, yeah, sure. Way and then we close, I promise. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Okay, so if I go, so let me just go back to okay. Here we go. So we are in uh, Singapore, the National Museum of Singapore. So in Singapore, I had three screens attached to uh, one another and uh, I edited the project so that the, uh, some, so you see, for example, you see two images on two screens right now. And sometimes they span on three screen. Uh, so it's, um, it was like a very impressive because you see, this person like in front of the screen, he looks so, so small and uh, it was extremely powerful to, to uh, be able to have this big space and, and all these screens attached together uh, to form like, like uh, an installation that was really, really immersive.
And it was, it was amazing to edit for that, for those three screens. So I edited this work for three screens and it's, uh, it was very, it pushed me to be creative, to do something different. Thank, voilà. you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Jeffrey. It was lovely to get to know more of your work. And I think now all of us want to see even more and hopefully in an installation in Lisbon. So thank you and hopefully see you soon. Thank you so much for your invitation. It was really a pleasure to, to share my work. And uh, especially in this time, you know, like seeing subways and passengers and public spaces filled with people, you know, uh, I think we all miss that. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Thank, Thank you again for your invitation. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.